We are now live, Matthew. Whoa, whoa. I don't think I've ever been live. Have I ever been live? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How are well, you doing, Trev? Brilliant, mate. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say, first of all, thank you, because I've wanted... Now, we can have a video, and we can do live streams, and we can chat for stuff for hours, hours, hours. But what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do, and we're doing it, is break it down. We spoke about Rambo uh, about five days ago. Uh, I wanted to chat to you about Black Hawk Down, and then next time we do a live, it'll be something else. But um, I'm interested in your perspective, perception, perspective, perspective, perspective or perception. I don't know which one is perspective. It? I'm interested. Perspective. In both. Okay. Both of those words, actually, because um, you are a massive advocate for the U.S. military, the military, mm. and veterans, and but you're also a movie star. And the one thing which resonates with me is had you have joined the military, I do not believe you would have been able to add as much value to veterans than you're currently doing as an actor. That's hmm. my um because people now watch you. Now, Black Hawk Down, one of the biggest grossing movies of all time. I know you've been in other ones, Ramble probably did better now though, but leading up to that. Mm -hmm. How did you get the call to be in the movie? Well, that's a great question, actually. But I w let me talk about what you just said first about um, about being an advocate for the military, and it, because it's it's kind of strange, right? So I was a few years ago. I was with a bunch of uh, veterans, and I had, I still had an opportunity that I could go and join the U.S. military. Right. Mm -hmm. And it were, I was seriously considering it. I mean, it would have been in like, a, it would have been in more like, a, a, like a press officer kind of thing. And I'd spoken to a couple of people and were like, yeah, we'd love to have you in. You can join the national guard and then you can be, you know, attached to this unit and you can go and do press and everything. And every single veteran that I spoke to said, do not do it. You are doing more as an actor that's going out and talking about veterans affairs than you could if you were in the army. And I, like, that was a very difficult thing for me to hear, to be honest, because, you know, I look at these guys like you and that's, we, we're such good friends. I respect you so much. Uh, it, it was, it was difficult to hear, right. That you can do a lot of work outside of the military uh, in being like a, an actor, which I think is like <laughs> I, just super lame. Like, you know, you know me, I don't take uh, actors seriously at all. Uh, I mean, I do, you know, I love the profession. It's what I always wanted to do. But that that was kind of a very interesting thing. You, you, you're not the only one to say that being someone that's doing movies and portraying people correctly is is more useful than coming in and being a part of the rank and file of the military. So, so anyway, um, that was that. But, yeah, so I am... Um, uh, I'm an actor. Let me talk about me, Trevor. You know that I like talking about myself. Oh. Come. Uh, what Black Hawk Down was your first? I think I don't know, but was that your first break into Hollywood? Yeah, it was. It was. So, so I just done a movie with Michael Caine. That at the time he was uh, he was Oscar nominated for Side House Rules. So I was getting a lot of attention from um, from American agents, and. I was also auditioning for Star Wars at the same time. So uh, that that was kind of a, a really interesting little period in my life, you know, because these agents were flying over and they were like, hey, come over. And I was like, this is a dream. So anyway, I went over and they said, um, one of the movies that, that, one of the big movies that was going on at the time was Black Hawk Down. And they were like, it's about army rangers. And, and in my head, I was like, Texas Rangers? Is that the same as Texas Rangers? Because I've heard of like, you know, Walker, Texas Rangers. I hadn't really heard of the uh, Army Rangers, but, you know, my my knowledge of the military was pretty much the British military, obviously. And I knew about Delta and knew about SEALs, but I didn't know about, and Green Braves, but I didn't really know about the Army Rangers. So anyway, I, they said, um, read the book. So I read the book, Mark Bowden's book, and they said, okay, well, we're going to send you a couple of scenes. And, and the interesting thing was um, it was a woman called Bonnie Timmerman who was doing the casting, and we all had to do Mike Durant's scene where he's been beaten up and, um, and you know, they've captured him, the Somalis have captured him. So I had to do that scene 
I went and then they called me back and they go, listen, Jerry Bruckheim and Ridley Scott want to see you tomorrow. And that was like, it's just another level. Right? I don't think people truly understand what it's like to even get a break like that. All right, to get a break, to be in the room with those people, it is it is like, it, it's unbelievable. You finally get a chance to show what you're made of. So I go in, and actually, I didn't have to do the audition. They'd seen the audition. Um, they were clearly going out, and they were looking at the guys that were up and coming, and you can see that in the film. Yeah. So there was a reputation. I'd got a reputation over there at the time. I'd just in this movie, Michael Caine, I'd... Uh, you know, done a bunch of other different bits and bobs. I'd had success in Coronation Street, even though, you know, people dismiss that. But, you know, I'd won this thing over here. I'd won the National Television Awards after being it for, for a few months. And so anyway, I I just go in and I have a chat with Ridley Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer. And it was a, a real out-of-body experience for me because I grew up loving Jerry Bruckheimer's movies and loving Ridley Scott's movies. I was a fan like anybody else. And... um I, I I came out and they said, okay, well, they're going to go through the motions, whatever they're going to. And so I flew back to the UK. I was, I was back and forth at that point. And they were like, listen, they like you. They've, they've blocked off. Cause what they do is they'll put you like on an option. They'll say like that, you know, they've done an availability check for you. So the, they done the availability check and I'm sitting there going, holy crap, like this is it. Um, good morning, by the way, everyone uh, that's joining in. And, um, and I remember it was late at night. It was like, I think it was like 11 o'clock at night in the UK. And I was in my house in Warsaw and my agent called me and they're like, listen, you've got it. Like you're going to go and you're going to be in Black Hawk Down. And I remember I had a bottle of champagne in the fridge and I went and got the bottle of champagne and I went round to my mom and knocked it, knocked on the door. And yeah, well, you know, with your mom, like, you know, whenever your mom gets a knock at like late at night, they're like, what has he done? <laughs> What's uh oh, <laughs> what has he done? And I just said to her, I've done it. I've done it. I've I've got a Hollywood movie. And it was it was just amazing. Wow. It was just amazing. Yeah. So right. So you know you're in the movie, you've read the book, so you understand what the book's about and the mission. Um you fly to America then, um, before you even start, even making your first scene. You have to go through military type training to get you up to speed, do you? Yeah, yeah. So, so we got a call, um, and they said, "Look, because it was kind of big around that period of time, they'd done a call in. Um, they'd done a call before for um, Pearl Harbor, where they got all the actors in. They called them all in. So they got a call. You know, they they called all the actors in, and they they took them to Hawaii, and they did a kind of a very rigorous." Uh, training regime over there. I think it was Dale Dye that did it, um, the great Dale Dye. Um, and, and so when it came to us, they were like, yeah, you're going to go and train with the Army Rangers. So we actually, uh, they gave us some training over in the UK first. So they said, like, you can have some physical training to get yourself up to speed because, you know, I mean, I was running all the time. I was running every day, um, doing about six miles every day. So th the running aspect of it, I was all right. Um but you know they don't know they they don't know what level of um physical ability you're at as an actor so i remember going down and i can't remember where it was now it was a really nice country club um and that's where i bumped into you and bremner for the first time and i you know i loved his work from train spotting and and i remember him and he was from what i remember he was not looking forward to doing the training because uh i think he he didn't have a very good experience uh, when he did Pearl Harbor. So uh, I was all like pumped up and let's put it like this. I was all pumped up to do it. Right. Cause I was like, Hey, I'll get to play soldier and I don't get shot at. And, and he wasn't like, he, he was just like, yeah, you know, he wasn't as in enthusiastic, I think, as I was doing the training cause he'd, he'd already done it. Right. So I think, yeah. I think it's like that. I, I know a couple of the actors were like, Oh, why am I doing this? You know, like, why am I, he wasn't like that. But a couple of the actors were like, why am I doing this? You know, I'm just an actor. And for me, I was like, this is great. So, yeah, they they flew us over and we went to uh, Fort Benning. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a really interesting moment because there's a place where all the Army Rangers get their haircuts. And, and you can see it in the special features, actually, because they have these, like, these clippers with giant vacuum hoses on them. 
And we all went down there and they're like, meh, 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 gone high and tight, right? Because uh, the high and tight was the signature of the, the Army Rangers. You know, you could tell an Army Ranger from, from a mile away, right? Because you could see his haircut. But, and the funny thing was, I believe that they changed that uh, when they went into Iraq, because obviously that's problematic when you're in the special operations community, which they are, that they become a little bit more of a target if ever they don't have, you know, they know they're coming into town kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, we did that. They put us up in the actual barracks that the guys from third battalion, yeah. uh, that, that were, that were involved in that operation. We stayed in those barracks and it was funny because they were all the, the, the new recruits had these really nice swanky barracks and, and yeah. we had these shitty barracks that I remember looking up one night. I, I roomed with a guy called Chicken who plays um uh he's, he plays one of the dry uh, the driver, you know, when he gets he goes, I can't see anything, sir. He's now yeah. dead, sadly. Um I can't remember why well, I'm blanking on his name now, the character he played, but the person he played. But I remember like we were boarding together in this room, and I look up and there's a frigging owl in our room because the, there was a giant hole in the wall that was to outside. So it wasn't, it wasn't like all glamor. Um, and, and I remember that, you know, the wonderful things that, you know, you guys in the army have to do like, you know, they had toilets and from what I can remember, they didn't have doors on the toilets. So we had to go down and we had to take one of those snap lights, you know, the chem lights. And we, we went down and we'd be like sitting there, like doing our business with a chem light, like, you know, reading something. We, uh, um Sorry, go we on. call them. They're silums. Gas watching. He's. I serve him. You're talking about silums. And the reason why they put you in there, in my opinion, is to harden you up to show you discipline working together. Because you know what? That type of a room with a hole in the ceiling, where you can look out, would piss off actors that think, "Why am I?" Here? But that type of a hole in the ceiling and that type of environment would make guys in the ASF and guys at that level just bond and go, and they would just go, oh, fuck it, and move their bed slightly to the right. They wouldn't care. Yeah. So it's all about getting that mentality of, of learning to keep you as a tight group. Because if you're bitching together, you're working together. Yeah. Well, you know, we it, it, I definitely had an experience like that film on that film that I like no other. I mean, you, you do tend to bond anyway, especially if you go away and you're in a foreign country and there's like, you know, sometimes there can be like six or seven of you and you're all in a hotel and you see each other every morning for breakfast and every lunchtime and every dinner. And then certainly when you're single, you're kind of like, what am I going to do on your days off? So, so it's kind of like a pressure cooker environment where you get to be, um, good friends with people. But uh, you know, I had a guy called Ian Virgo, who I'm going to interview at some point. Uh, uh, he was my ranger buddy. And the ranger buddy goes everywhere with you. You go for a dump, your ranger buddy goes with you. You go for a pee, your ranger buddy goes with you. You know, you you, you go and get some food, your ranger buddy goes with you. Or, or if he goes, you go with him. And it really did bond us. Like We're very good friends to this day. Like Ian can call me about anything. And I'd, dr I'd drop anything for him and go do it. And he'd be the same with me. Uh, so it really did forge that. Uh, the only thing that I think that I wish that we'd have done differently on that was uh, everyone else was wearing greens, green, and we were wearing desert uniform, mm. which was, it's kind of weird because just after that, everyone deployed to the desert, right? Like just a year after that. But we stuck out. And when we certainly stuck out when we were doing our uh, square bashing, we were completely abysmal. I mean, it was just so embarrassing. But we did get to go and do things like, I mean, obviously going to the chow hall, um, uh, you know, stopping whenever they were playing uh, taps. Um, I mean, you got beasted if you didn't stop, right, when they were playing that. Uh, and then we got to do their version of uh, the Kill House over there. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we learned how to do room clearance. That was a real big thing there, actually. Yeah. Um, doing, you know, how you how you go, how you stack on a on a door, whether it's a door to the left side, to the right side, center fed door. How you go through who, and that, as you know, Trev, that really bonds you because if your responsibility going through that door is shooting the guy that can be to your left, 
And you've got to let the guy behind you take care of the guy that's directly in front of you when you're going in because you're moving so fast. That's his area that he's got to look out for. Like, um, yeah. You have to trust them. And it was amazing. It, I mean, it, it changed my life. It just, it just absolutely changed my life doing that. It was a great movie. Um, whenever I was watching, I mean, Jesus, it's, it's like two decades old now, isn't it? But um, whenever I first watched it, I mean, I was like, this is this this is awesome. This is awesome. What they were doing is the movie was replicating what took place in Mogadishu, clearly. And um, yeah, it was a great movie. It it was a terrible time for the U.S. military, but it was a great movie. And uh, but it wasn't until say I don't know 10, 15 years later when I was learning um, stacking up uh, entry drills and things. Um, I sort of take a step back now, and it's really just reminded me is when I watched the movie, um, they hadn't went fully, they didn't know what they were going to expect. So, yep. I mean, today going through there, we would have had engineers with us with mouse, with mouse hole charges, side entry, and not, we'd have done stacking up, going through the different uh, entry holes, moving to the corners and everyone. But then um, considering, they, considering they're trained in special forces, they were on fantastic operators. It was, um, it was one hell of a shock to, to, to see the casualty rate, you know, shocking yeah. me. And that's that's guerrilla warfare for you. Yeah, I mean, we I mean, look, we, we got to, as I said before, we got to play soldiers. And um, when I first read the book, I was like, how are they going to make this into a positive? Right. Because there were so many mistakes that happened. Uh, you know, the communication up to the the birds that were flying over our heads. So when the Humvees were going down the street, they'd radio up. Uh, that would then be communicated. I mean, it was a complete nightmare. So they just kept missing the turns and then they'd end up being funneled back through where all these guys were, you know, and they were like, shit, we're going back through it again. And And like you said, that was the... If you think about it, so we shot that in 2000, 2000 and there we, we hadn't been to Iraq. Like the the nine eleven hadn't happened. We we weren't being in Iraq. We we hadn't gone to Iraq yet, and that kind of warfare really hadn't happened. The, the only where the the only place that it had happened was in Northern Ireland, where people were going like door to door. It hadn't really um, the the American military hadn't really seen any fights like that delta probably had you know when they were going in grenade and whatever but it wasn't it wasn't really um a, a well, like the tactics weren't really well known so for example um you know you know keep putting your arm up like that like you'll see in a lot of movies people go along with their arms up like that well later on they learned that they've got to keep their arm down by their side right because you can't run along a wall if your arm's out like this, right? Cause you're going to hit things. So now, you know, they, they started doing things a little bit more differently, keeping it nice and close like this and, and changing, changing tactics, which every single unit, I think it, it, it bleeds down from those kind of special operations units. It goes down and filters down to everybody. And that's why now you look and and you see, I mean, clearly, um, more, we say more regular army units have had just as much um, combat experience as back then as as those guys did who were who were really elite. And it, we were really fortunate because we had a couple of the guys that were actually there uh, yeah. with us. Um, John Collette was with us in when we were in Rabat when we were filming. We had Lee Van Arsdale, who's a Delta guy. He was with us. Uh, really amazing, uh, and you know our um, our prop master was an army ranger as well. So so they took everything very 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 seriously, and they they communicated that to us as well. And I think because there were a lot of Brits on it, we were the the British actors were kind of very respectful of the fact that we were playing Americans and and Americans that had died. So I don't know if that had anything to do with the the amount of respect that was given in that film mm. uh, not only just the tactics but you know to the people to to the guys that died um yeah, yeah it, it was um it was really quite something and, and and you know also going out in um we're out in rabat which is kind of like you know it was the wild west uh in morocco so the the scenes where the guys going on the little birds like you know you see kim coates turn around and he's like two minutes 
they were on those birds. That that is not CG. Like they are on the little birds. And there is yeah. no way they'd let us do that. I mean, they should just clip them in and they were like, yeah, let's go. I mean, and, and you did have a bunch of alphas that were with that were totally down with doing that stuff. So well, I mean, it came across um you could see that every individual that was yourself, you you and McGregor, you had uh, Orlando Blue, but there, there were so many actors that are doing well now that the you could see that they knew they were on show. That was mm. like, it's now my scene. I have to, every scene was owned. It was really well put together. Um, I don't know what what I got from that. Uh, when I watched that movie, at the end of it, at the end of it, when the TV goes blank and I reflect on that movie, it's like, wow, those guys went through a lot. Uh, at the start of the movie, uh, at the, well, forget about the movie, at the start of that operation, you can see that there is clearly an ego, ego maniacs between Delta and Rangers. It's a massive ego fight. It's a fuck fest at the start of that screen. It's, it's, as you can see, everyone's like, and the way Eric Banner portrays the guy going through, going, that's my safety, and he does that, and he's sort of putting. But at the end of that movie, you could see that they gelled. And the only thing that I took away from that was, yes, it was an operation that went tits up, but it was an operation that showed the world that the US never leave a man behind. Well, they used to. Yeah, that's. I mean, I think that 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 was one of the. And not to talk too politically about this, I think that was, you know, for me, that was drummed into us: never leave a man behind. Never, you know, you never leave a fallen comrade. I mean, it's it's in the range of creed, right? You just don't do it, and they will expend any kind of capital to get in there and bring those guys home. And then Afghanistan happened. I mean, it was such a betrayal. Yeah. The way they just bugged out and left everybody. Yeah. And, I, and I think that that was the one thing that I got working with those guys is they were like, listen, they're going to come back for me. And, and you know, you saw, and it, look, it's giving me goosebumps right now where they go, Mike Durant, we will not leave you. Night Stalkers never quit. I mean, look at that. I, I mean, I've got, I got goosebumps right now. I, the guy that went in and picked up the Delta guy um, uh, in the film and put him on the little bird was the guy that did that in real life. Like he was the saw pilot the 160th saw um he did that for real and he said this is exactly like mogadishu it is exactly like it uh so it, i mean it was um it, it was it was quite something to be a part of that and and i that was the moment for me where i understood um the love of country that americans have it really um, solidified that for me and it's exemplified in the military. Now, I think that's the same in the UK as well. I think that people love the army. They love the air force. They love the Navy. You know, I mean, I think that they, they really appreciate it. And it is the, to me, it's the best of, uh, the best of us, you know, if you're willing to go out there and, and fight for freedom, which they, they are and, and, and you've done, uh, I mean, it's it's just, it, it's epic, right? I mean, it's it's what all the great stories in history talk about about heroes, and if we don't have heroes like that, and and Trev, I, you know, I've told you, I, I I don't care, you know, but you are a hero, you, you know, you are absolutely a hero. People love you because, you know, you you are humble. You've done extraordinary things, uh, and you did it for a a, a bigger. A, a bigger mission as it were uh, and it might have been just for the guys next to you at that moment right uh, in that in that in that particular moment but it takes a very special person to say i'm going to go and i'm going to go and fight for my country it's 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 very rare and in a in a society where we have a bunch of snowflakes and people that that make things important that aren't important you kind of know what's up and i think that people are re really respond to that you know what I mean? I think they really do. I did when I did Black Hawk Down, and that's why yeah. you know even even here, you know, I've got the Mighty Oaks Foundation. As you know, these yeah. are guys that amazing guys that do incredible things, um, looking after veterans because you know the war. It's it seems a cheesy thing to say, you know, the war has ended uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the war is still going on for many soldiers, and and we can't forget that. 
Well, thank you, Matt. But you've got to bear in mind that myself and the majority, I'm going to make a number up. I'm going to go 90%. I think 90% of young men that join the military do it just to get away, have a better life, see the world. When they, whenever they first do it, it's certainly not to put themselves in danger. That comes through training, honestly. Yeah. So the first thing is get away, see the world. Wow, this is brilliant, getting paid money. And and then things change and you adapt. And as you go through the rank structure or else as you go through experience and you learn, uh, because you don't know everything and you never will, but there's guys in your platoon around you who probably know more than you or less than you, but even the ones that know less than you, the bit that they know less than you, is something that you don't know. So you're learning off each other. I get from those movies, um, Hollywood, Hollywood turns individuals into heroes uh, because a medal's a medal. Uh, tours are tours. No one gets to find out. It's not until it's written down and put together that these things can either take off or don't take off. But Hollywood has this has this sense of no man's left behind. But as you said rightly, in reality, there's Afghanistan that fell apart. There's Benghazi, which was I'm not going to go down those oh. roads. With you. But the, Benghazi. The if, can I just say about Benghazi? I knew about Benghazi way before the the movie came out. And by the way, I mean Michael Bay made a masterpiece in that film. He did. Uh, it was horrendous what they did there, and the media just dismissed it because they were like, "Oh, it's a political thing. We don't want to say this about Hillary Clinton." Benghazi was an absolute disgrace. It was an utter disgrace. Like what happened to those guys over there was unbelievable. They were completely abandoned. D don't even get me on that, Trev, because because you know, I mean, obviously, over the years, I've got to be friends with a lot of people that are so, that have been involved. Let's bring you back to Black Hawk Down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Benghazi, we're, Benghazi. We're we're back in Mogadishu. All right. Not Hollywood so, Mogadishu, not for real. So you're in there. Um, what was it like? I take it you were all up and coming at the time. Uh, even mm. Eric Bana at the time, uh, hi, uh, my yeah. friends in this chat room. Even Eric Bana at the time had done Chopper, which was gr a gritty movie in, in Australia. He hadn't really done that much, and that uh, he got through it. And he he got to play, I think, one of the leading roles. Ma well, he did massive role for him. Um, yeah. How come he got that role, and and, and maybe uh, Hugh McGregor didn't, Orlando Bloom didn't, or some of the other actors didn't? What made him stand out in the in the auditions then? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I would imagine at that period of time, um, he wouldn't have. I mean, there were some guys on there that probably didn't audition, right? Yeah. They they were probably got the. I mean, I don't know because I mean, certainly Josh Hartnett had just come off the back of Pearl Harbor. You know, he was a giant star. Uh, it's difficult for people to to kind yeah. of comprehend that because because Josh like turned his back on everything and just and just walked away. I mean, I remember being in um being in his suite in um in Rabat in the Rabat Hilton and and he was really reluctant to be a star, and it was kind of it was kind of strange because I'm like, dude, you just did you just did two Michael Bay movies and and he was the biggest director in the world at that point, like making giant movies. I mean, his his films were you know he just done Bad Boys and that was massive, and then he did Pearl Harbor, um, but so I don't know. I mean, it, so if you look at the age of the guys, right? Like I was, I think I was 27 when I did that film. Uh, the rest of the army rangers were around 21, 22, like the actors that played them. So I'm a little bit older than Tom Hardy. Uh, if you looked at the Delta, they were a little bit old. So I was like right just below the Delta guys, but older than the rangers uh, because I had a little bit of a baby face. So I think I got away with it. Um, but they tended to cast the army rangers younger and the delta yeah. guy is older and ewan was ewan was the a big star actually i mean ewan had done had done star wars at that point so uh yeah, he was he was definitely a star uh, i don't know if it was like you know because the way that the movie was written is really brilliantly written by ken nolan there's a lot of different um threads that go through it right so that if you think about it there's the Delta guys that go off, but there's there's Eric that's got his own like little thing going on, and then there's the story of um, Ewan's 
uh, Grimes, they call it, which is Stebbins in real life. So, so there was his thing. And then, so I end up going back in as well and splitting and going in with Delta. So th there were all these different threads. And I think that they did a really good job of spreading it, um, yep. spreading the responsibility out in those different roles. And of course, Tom Sizemore had done, um, Oh, we've lost Trevor. Sorry about there that. There you go. Yes. Um, did, did I say, was it something seconds, I said? But, uh, we're back. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we all had different, oh. we all had, di had different roles. No. Uh, go on. Can people hear? I can oh, hear you. I can't. As long as everyone can hear, because I can't hear you. I'm very I interesting. Yeah, I can't hear I'm you. I'm going to text you. <laughs> uh, let me just check this. Mute. No, Matthew. Unmute. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? I. Uh oh. Technical well, if people can hear, they can hear. I can't. I can't hear now for some reason. Go out and come back in. I'm going to mime to. This is where my acting. Me go out, come back yeah, in. Yeah, you go out and right. come back in. As we long might... as people can hear. Can, uh, yes, we can hear. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, people can hear us both. It doesn't matter. Um... <laughs> you can't. That's just we mental. can't do that. We can't That's do because that because somebody tried to call me in the middle of this. But oh, uh, yeah. so I'll you, ask you, you can a have question to go then. out and then come back in. Me, hold on. Yeah. Uh, uh oh, guys, we might lose everything. Oh, there you go. And now it's the Matthew Marsden show. We don't need Trevor Colt. Uh, let me talk about me for another twenty minutes. I'm joking. It's funny because whenever you meet these guys that have done really exceptional things, they're so humble. Is it, Are you back, Trev? Trevor? People can hear me. I'm going to I'm going to remove you from the stage, Matthew, and try and bring you back in. So hold on. Can people hear me now? I'm hoping everyone can hear me now. That's a good idea. I've just got to hear Matthew, and then we're back. Okay, one second then. When Matthew comes back in, we'll get back into it again. Uh, one way to get your own gig. It, well, it was, it's, I know I'm an arse, aren't I? I didn't expect this to happen, people. And for those that were asking, behind me, oh, behind me is a, that's inside of a Chinook helicopter. We are, that's my guys. We are about to fly in to do an assault onto a Taliban compound. And that's us all in the back of the helicopter looking down and sit. So, and anyway, here we go. Um, hold on. Hold on. Guest. There we go. Uh, uh, there you go. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly oh, well. Oh, yes. Success. See, he's not only, he's not just a pretty face, ladies and gentlemen. Trevor is now a tech guru. I'm not. I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> I mean, I was lost there. I, I can only use one finger when I'm doing this. I haven't got Anyway. Do you know um, what? I, I, you can put it on do not disturb. That's what I do when I go in. If you put do not disturb, nobody can call you. Well, I need to learn that. I mean, I'm only learning. That, I, I've only just learned that my battery's going down. Go on go on the settings, down the battery, put it on long. So I've, I've only just learned that. You know, you gotta, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, the movie was filled with iconic actors. Um. Mm -hmm. I, I think I mentioned this to you in the last chat we had, but right. So say there's now the movie's done, it's done and dusted, but there's 10 of you that are well known. Do you, do you get given certain areas like Eric, you'll do this premiere and the screening in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, Matthew, you'll go to London and Manchester. Do you, do you all have to go to the certain areas for, for, um, you know, Probably. sometimes, yeah, sometimes it can be like that. With Black Hawk Down, it was really unique because it was a, an American movie, right? Like, yeah. essentially an American movie about an American operation. But it was a British director, and it was it had a lot of British actors in it. So it was, uh, it was kind of amazing, actually, because we did the London premiere, and that was... <sighs> Just unbelievable. And what was funny about that was Jerry Bruckheimer called me and he's like, hey, Matt, you know, do you want to come down to London and hang out uh, uh, for a couple of days before? And I was like, yeah. So, you know, we, we I had a, I went down to Clar Claridge's Darling. And um, and so we had the premiere there and everyone was there, which was, which was really amazing. And I, I do want to tell you guys, um, 
a little bit of a funny story. So years and years and years ago, I don't think I've ever told this story. Um, when I was going through college, when I was doing my degree, I, I, I was from a working class background, Trev. I had no money. Like, you know, my mom couldn't help me out. You know, she was a single parent. So I did modeling to pay my way, right? I, I got into the clothes show competition and and then I, I managed to get an agent. So I go and I do commercials mainly. It was mainly commercials uh, because of the acting. And my agent was Davina McCall. A lot of people don't know this. So Davina McCall was my agent. And I remember she knew that I was training to be an actor. I wanted to be an actor. And, and one day she um, she came up to me and she said, Matt, can, can we go out for lunch? I, I want to talk to you. And she was talking about wanting to be a, a presenter. And I was like, yeah, you know, I remember we went on the King's Road. It was like a, a real magical time around the, the 90s. Uh, in London. And so we went to this restaurant on, on the King's Road and I was like, I think you'd be amazing. I mean, she was always, I, I mean, I haven't seen her in a long time, but back then she was just incredible. And so I go to the premiere in Leicester Square and it was huge. You know, it was just a, I mean, cause it was a mega movie with all these different people and all these different actors, Ridley Scott, Jerry Brockheimer. And I remember going up the, because we'd got, um, I can't remember whether it was the Odeon at Leicester Square, but it but it was multiple multiple floors, mm -hmm. and um, so we were. I was going up the escalator, you know, because that escalates a different floor, and she's there. I think you've got that mixed up with Harrods, darling. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't working at Harrods. No, I mean, I know someone just said that that she's woke now, but I, I don't know. I mean, I always she was always amazing to me, and I. I I'm going up the escalator and I see her and I hadn't seen her since we'd had that conversation. Hmm. So I'd gone off and I'd done Coronation Street, I'd done the music and then I'd gone over and I, I did this movie. So it was, a, it was a real moment, right, where you you look at each other, she's there presenting, interviewing people and I saw her and she just burst out crying and and I, I just gave her a big hug. It, it, was a, it was a real moment because people think that, you know, when you get to, it's like it's like with you, right? Like, you join the army. You don't know really what's going to go on. You don't, I mean, I think that with the war that was going on in Iraq, yeah, people know that they're going to go into war, right? You're going to, you're going to face it. Whereas I think pre Iraq, like people didn't, you know, you might be deployed to Northern Ireland or Cyprus or whatever, uh, but you're not really going to be in the fight as it were. And you don't, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Right, you you never think that you're going to get there, right? Like you never like I'm, I'm sure you didn't go out there and go, hey, listen, I'm going to get the military cross. You know, I'm I'm not going to. You never think that, and it's the same with actors. Like when I started off as an actor, I just thought, you know, this is what I really want to do. I really love it. It's a completely mental in you know industry to go into because nobody ever makes it. Uh, yeah. I, and and I I genuinely thought that I was going to be I was going to do theater or musicals in the West End or whatever, if, if I was lucky, the dream was to be in a movie. So when yeah. you get to that point, um, it's, it's a, it's a very strange place to be, right? I mean, you must have the same thing. Like, it's almost like it's happening to another person, like another person did those things, especially when you, you look back on it. Right. I mean, do, do you feel the same? Yeah. Well, um, but the thing is, it's, it's weird because I did about five, I think maybe five or six, six operational tours without even, truthfully, without even having to cock, without even having to cock my rifle. They were just, don't get me wrong, Northern Ireland was all, I was always on edge there, even though I'm from there. Of but course, yeah. I always had a magazine, obviously the magazine uh, loaded, but I was never made ready. Uh, I didn't have to make ready. Um, that's, an, that. even me, thing is, making ready is an, es is an escalation of force. So, it's something you don't have to do most of the time. But uh, even during the Gulf, the Gulf War, 2003, I cocked my rifle about 10 times, but it ran out of the the escalation because I was um, at a bank in Iraq. Um, uh, it was, clearly the bank was being used to hold munitions. So, but whenever the engineers came to blow the munitions, the crowd outside was hot. There's a reason I'm telling this. The crowd outside was hundreds of people, and my section had been given the task to keep hundreds of people back. There's only eight of us, and we're spread yeah. out. And 
when the engineers blew the munitions, the locals thought we'd blown the safe and they rushed us. And one of my escalators was cocking the rifle to make them go back. But once once you cock the rifle, um, you can only do it so many. Th then you've got to go away and you've got to make safe and come back out. And once you do it a couple of times, it loses the it loses the, yeah, so the impact. I, yeah, have, yeah. I mean, I found the Gulf War quite easy, if I'm honest, because everyone surrendered. Uh, it wasn't Af Afghanistan. Yeah. I think once you you have your first engagement with enemy forces and you you exchange bullets towards enemy forces, it's just, as you did a minute ago with your hers. The hers stand up. It's a buzz. The adrenaline rush. You, you forget the weight you're carrying because your whole mindset changes. But when you've done that for twenty seven days in a row, mate, it it uh, even even yeah. even an exchange of firefight with enemy sounds weird saying this loses its buzz. It does. It, the next escalation of that is 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 actually seeing the bodies you, you you've dropped or casualties you've taken. And even and then, I, is it is it like a surreal thing? Like, hang on a minute, like you don't really process it because I think always, that sometimes your your brain like can't deal with that. It's always surreal to look over and see um, friends injured as casualties, uh, or even or even parts of people and your friends aren't there anymore to see that but the weird thing is and i never thought this would ever happen and i'm sure there's people in the chat that can understand this but see whenever it's happened once it's a shock it's a shock oh jesus two or three times it's not a shock anymore uh, mm -hmm. the weird thing is whenever for instance uh you're going down banks you, you see the smoke then you hear the bang then you look around there's you hear the bullets coming in you can hear the, the you can hear the um You can hear where the shots coming from, and, and when when you hear the strike, you sort of I can't remember the name of it, but you work out the distance, and you think, well, that's a few hundred meters away, and you, you're able to work out that in your head anyway. But whenever you've taken a casualty, you don't. This is shit to say this. You don't think about what's going on there. The first thing you think about is, okay, uh, I need to send a contact report, medic, yeah. deal with him. I want him prioritized. Let's go through the checks, make sure all around defense training. There's about there's about 10 things you need to do on the radio as well as secure the area as well as get top cover up or get uav up or predator up call for qrf you want um fire support you want casualty accession coming out you want to spread your there's about your head's filled with things so you don't you're not able to look down at the damage caused to your your own bodies your, your own yeah the soldier becomes he's not your priority let the medic deal with him that's being dealt with. Your job now is to make sure the other guys aren't looking out. They're sorry, aren't looking in. They're looking out. Arcs are covered all around the fence. So it's you don't think about it. So the, the the answer is you never ever think about the guy or the girl that's just been shot because you're too busy dealing with other stuff to make that safe. So um yeah, you know you know Trev, I um I had a conversation that I think you'll find this really interesting. I had a conversation with Jeff Struka and Struka. Um, is the guy that was driving the Humvee column in Black Hawk Down. He's an amazing guy, like amazing. Mm -hmm. Like this guy, they used to call him like Captain America because he was, you know, he's he's he, if you look him up, he looks like Captain America. He's a big square jaw, like he's what, what you'd imagine an American soldier to be like, right? Mm -hmm. And But he's a Christian. And he was in the middle of the fight. This is a very interesting, I think, psychology to this. He was in the middle of all that. And again, like I said, that they, they there is a slight difference, I think, between Brits and Americans. And like you said, I'm, the guys that I grew up with, uh, they joined the military. My, my friend Paul joined because he was going to go to jail. I mean, he, he punched a guy out um, and he ended up being a policeman, an accident, undercover policeman. I mean, he was going to join anyway. Um, but he kind of had an acceleration. You should speak to him sometime because he's, he's my yeah. closest and oldest friend and I love him. And, yeah. and he ended up being a grenadier guard. Uh, and, and he was the one that taught me all about like the buttons on the tunic and where the, the plumes are and all that. And I, I love all that. He told me, you know, one, it's the grenadier guard Two, It's like the Colstein guards. I think it, what, what, you know, he told me that the button then, but, um, uh, it, there's certainly, with Americans, there is a um, love of country, right? That that and love of freedom, and that's one of the things that I found 
when I'd have the conversation because, you know, my buddies would be like, yeah, I'm going in the signals because I want to learn it, you know, how to use electronics. I'm going to get a trade. I'm going to do this. The, the, the guys that love fighting were like, I'm going to join the parachute regiment because I can go and like kick the shit out of some people. Um, yeah. You know, my, my other buddies, I mean, they're all like, like very physically able, you know, and coming from a working class background, you know, I was surrounded by that. Uh, but Jeff Struker, interestingly, he was a Christian and he said that he knew he was going to die, right? Now, I'm just talking about mentality, right? He was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to get to heaven. All right, well, let's just get on with business. And the funny thing is, because uh, he interviewed me, and I, I want to try and interview him as well because, I mean, he's, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, he's a pastor now. He goes and preaches. But um, everyone was like, why are you so calm? <laughs> It was just like totally chilled the whole way, still taking care of business, right? But in his own mind, he was like, I'm dead. I'm dead. So whatever. I've just got to take care of business, kill as many of them as I can, uh, and and that's it. But he, he kind of made his peace. You, you know what I mean? And I just think that's a really interesting mindset. Well, it is. I mean, um, I um... – when I was in, Af I'll only talk about Afghan. When I was in Afghanistan, because because that was my last three tours in the army were in Afghanistan. But um, I was working with individuals uh, in the parachute regiment on my own platoon, which were, the, I mean, I've never worked with guys like that before. The mindset was just focused. They were super fit. I mean, the guys loved training. They they beat each other every day. I mean, I worked with two para, three para, and um, ranger platoon, one Irish out there, and. I didn't come across what I would call a passenger. There was yeah. no passengers. There was no passengers there. Everyone added value. Yes, we all made silly mistakes at some stage doing things, but then um, we did. We made mistakes in camp. That was it. Like forgetting to turn up to something and I'm, I'm doing something or, or late for something. But outside of camp, the minute the minute we went out those gates, um, every single man was like, uh, I think. I think the power say every man an emperor. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I, I didn't see any unprofessionalism. They worked hard. They knew the dangers and they still ran towards it at every single occasion. There wasn't once where I went dick or someone called me a dick, probably did actually, but we worked with guys that were willing to, they were willing to take that bullet for their buddy. And uh, it was a great atmosphere to be around. I mean, there's not once when I'm out on the ground, I don't get me wrong, I knew that I could be shot at any moment, but I didn't care because I knew the guys around me. We put more fear into the Taliban than they put into us. They they did not want to come anywhere near us. We were there. The Paras are an exceptional, robust, powerful unit when they're out working together. Yeah, downtime, back in camp, nightmare, like anyone, <laughs> but uh, out on the ground... Um, Do you know, can, can I tell you a little story there? This is totally segwaying away, like moving away from uh, from uh, uh, Black Hawk Down. But years and years ago, uh, because I, I was obviously like the rest of the people from my area, you know, that it, it does come across, you, you know, in discussion about career because it was my, way more likely that I'd join the military than I'd become an actor. Right? I mean, it just, just way more likely. Now, whatever level that would be, right? So... Uh, of course, you know, I, I don't know why, but there was a lot of uh, people that, I mean, one of one of my friends actually went, he, he went into the Royal Marines and, and was in the SBS for years and years and years and years. So, you know, there was a, people spoke about the Royal Marines a lot uh, in, in my area and I'd considered joining. Uh, I have asthma. I, I wouldn't have made a good Marine. I'm, I'm not at all. Um, but so I'm in, in Jersey doing a TV show. This is no joke. I haven't, I've never told you this, Trev. It's kind of funny. So I'm doing a TV show called Island, which was set in Jersey. And we're in the middle of nowhere, right? Just in the middle of nowhere in Jersey, these fields. And I look across. I'll never forget it because it was a, there was an England game playing. Uh, I, do you know when it was? I'll tell you when it was because around the same time, everyone was watching the OJ Simpson chase. Do you remember that? Where they were chasing after RJ Simpson. So I look across, it's no joke, Trev, and I see three guys. One, got to be like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, just freaking massive. Just like Jack, like, bro. 
and this other one that was like medium size, and then another guy that was really short. And they were both wearing bright red wigs, like curly wigs. And they're wearing a maroon, they're all wearing maroon sweaters, right? And I look across and I'm like, who are these guys? And I, I'll never forget the conversation. As they come close and come close, I see they've got the the little badge and they're paras, right? And they, you know, because they've got that mustache, you know, the army, <laughs> the, the army mustache, which nobody used to have apart from people in the army uh back then. And um they were playing the scousers. Hey, all right, okay, all right. Like this, Barry, and it was in the middle. Gary. Hey, Gary, 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 Hey, all right, calm down. And and I was, uh, they were doing this in the middle of nowhere. Like there was nobody watching them, right? They're walking down the street. Hey, all right, calm down. Okay, calm down. And I, and I go over to them because even back then I would. I go, I go, hey lads, like what's going on? How you doing? And and they're like, all oh, right, yeah. They'd obviously been having a few jars. Yes. It's more like that. It was like, you know, midday. And uh and I and and I was like, oh, you know what you're doing? You're like, yeah, we're in the parachute regiment, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what they were doing there. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. Uh and I said, you know, I um, you know, I, when I was younger, I I was thinking about joining the Royal Marines. That's when I realized that they had an issue with the Royal Marines. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, why not the Paris? Why not the Paris? Why and I was like, uh, <laughs> I didn't really think about it. And the, dude, that they that switch flipped. And yeah. I was like, oh, shit. Like, you know, that he was just like. Poof. And that's when, you know, I really realized, you know, when you, as you know, uh, um, you know, I haven't been in Hollywood all my life. And, you know, I grew up on a council estate. Uh, so I've seen that moment many times in a pub. And I was like, oh, you know, but I mean, they were cool. But it was kind of it was funny um, being around them and and um, you know and, and so it's been a very different like progression for me working with the veterans over in the United States. Um, uh, you know, talking about running to uh, running to gunfire. So I, I not I didn't experience this, but it was a very interesting experience that that I had. Um, so Gary Sinise, who was a friend of mine was doing the, I think it was like the 25th anniversary of Forrest Gump or the 20th anniversary of Forrest Gump, something like that. And he'd invited... Just, sorry, just for those watching, uh, Gary Sinise played Lieutenant Dan in yeah. Forrest Gump. Yeah, he's a he's an amazing human being. You know, he's um he's done so much for veterans over here. The Gary Sinise Foundation is, is just unbelievable. And he's a real deal. He's a really good guy. And so it invited me to this like anniversary of Forrest Gump, and I'm like, okay, I went. And so what they were doing, it, it was at Paramount, and Paramount in in LA in Hollywood is like an old school. It's like it's you see on all you know whenever they show pictures of going to Hollywood, come to Hollywood, and you can see the the famous Paramount Arch, and it really is like when you're there, it really feels like an old school studio, you know, like if, yeah. you, you can tell that all these movies have been done there, and um, and so I'm there with a bunch of veterans because he, he took a bunch of veterans for the Gary Sinise foundation and like Robert Zemeckis turned up, Tom Hanks turned up, did a speech and whatever about uh, Forrest Gump. It was really great, but I'm outside and we're all eating. It's a beautiful California day. And I hear this colossal bang and clearly there'd just been a, a big car accident. Like because Paramount is right on a road, like where we was right near the road. I have never seen men move so fast. Every veteran was like, gone. They were just gone. Like all of them ran and they were out that they, they somehow got out. I don't know how they got out because there's gates all the way around it. They, they managed to get out. They were the first people right there to help the person get out the car. And it was, it wasn't like <clears throat> I'm sitting there thinking about it. The moment the bang happened, they were gone. It, it was, uh, it was really, it was just one of those moments where you realize that there are some men that are just very different to other men. Yeah. It just is. So I'm just, just reading some messages coming in. People are supportive of Gary Sinesh. Yeah, there's a lot of things happening here. Yeah, yeah, Gary's the real deal, by the way. For anyone that's like, you know, uh uh watching this and what he like he's exactly what you see, is what you get, you know. He's amazing. I do want to tell you this though, Trev, you know, cause we haven't spoken about Black Hawk Down. 
kind of went off a bit. But we yeah. did on that movie for people that are wondering. So for any of the, if you see any of the explosions, um, those are all practical effects, right? So yeah. so when they shoot the RPG, the RPG goes down a piano wire. It's like a piece of piano wire and it goes and it blows up. And when we would do those scenes where we're, if you can remember the part where I was in, where we're going through the Bacara market um, and doing that movement, they would bury um, Corbold special effects, who's the best in the business. He would, Neil Corbold would go and he would bury these little bullet hits, right? So you'd have these like lines of like, so you go down in a line. Right. And then, so they'd also have guys with like paintball um, and they have these like little dust balls and they'll shoot you with them. They don't hurt. Right. So the reason why I'm saying that is Ridley would come up to us right? and he'd go and, and all, you know, all great directors really are like this, that they, they cast well. And so they know that the actors are, are competent or very good, you know, as, as they're going to hit their lines, they, they hit their marks, they're going to say their lines and they're going to bring something. And he might like nudge you one way or the other, or give you like, say, Hey, listen, think about this, think about that when you go in the situation. And he'd come up to us and he'd go, all right, now Matt, um, you're going to run down there. Okay. And there's going to be a lot of gunfire, boom, bang. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to stop filming and you'd be like, Okay. And then so they go rolling, and then you'd run, and then you just go ba 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 ba. So those reactions that you see from the actors are real. Yep. Yeah. Because we don't know where those hits are coming from. So so you know when the actors like, like especially like Tom Guyry, I think I mean uh, Ewan does you know when he gets blown up, uh, you know so what they do is they have these like cannons that are sunk into the floor, and they have this um, it's kind of um, like rubber. It's like black rubber. And they, I mean, I, I just remember that like every day we'd come home and you'd just be covered in black rubber, like bits of little bits of black rubber. But they just go like that. And you would, like with a big explosion like that, you kind of know where that is. But the bullet hits you didn't. Um, I mean, they'd tell you, they go, they're along the wall or yeah. they're down the middle. And then you go, but you didn't really know if they were going to go. Pah, 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 pah. And so that's why it's so raw. And, and, and the guys that were actually there, said it was exactly like it. So uh, the reason why I say that, Trev, is I feel like I got to experience like kind of like a a taste of war yeah. with no risk, you know, because no risk. But, but you, you know, you got to remember this. When you're doing a movie like that and you've got, we had four Black Hawks, four Little Birds, two um, Bell Ranger helicopters, and there were maybe there were Hueys like with cameras on the front. It sounds like the end of the world is coming, and you know it's Ridley Scott, and you know it's Jerry Bruckheimer, and you know there's like millions of dollars on the line. So when they say rolling, your heart rate is going. And then you're yeah. off. Right? So, I so that feeling. Yeah. You're like, but, you know, so you yeah. are on edge. Sorry. It, yeah. I, I, yeah, I felt that edge. I felt that edge where you are, every sense you have is focused on what's in front of you. I mean, but there's a few people in the chat that understand this. Whenever you are focused and your eyes are on stocks and you're scanning for what is a possible life-ending experience or the movie, you're thinking the same thing. You're like, this is a career ending. This is a career ending thing. I'm thinking, <laughs> so I'm thinking this is a life ending. I need to I, I need to get this right. You're thinking this is this this first movie could end my career. I need to get this right. So your adrenaline everything but see whenever you are focused on what's in front of you and you're such concentrating on it the one thing that stands out like a bass drum is your own heart your heart you hear that and it's the loudest thing and you're like what and then you start to think how can i focus because my heart is like the loudest thing i've ever heard because your whole body is just sensed towards the front and yes you are focused and yes at that stage at that stage, you are made ready. You are made ready. There's a round in the chamber. Your safety catch is on, but your finger is right on the safety catch, and you are waiting for that opportunity. Uh, it's a bit like your your finger's probably on the trigger, 
But that trigger to you at that stage is career ending, career ending. I mean, I need to get this right. I need to get this right. So it's the same adrenaline. It's the same type of thing, but the, well, really the, stakes, the stakes are a little bit different. <laughs> Like you know, if we high, we yeah. get to do another, we get to do another take, right? You, you know, you don't get to do another take. But but they would come up to us as well, Trevor. Like so, I had the the saw, the squad automatic weapon, the the M two four nine. So they would come in, and you know, I mean, we've seen a lot of a lot of this recently with you know accidents going on on set. But they would come in and they would load that that round, and uh, because they had to make sure. I mean, well, I'd load the round. Uh, but you weren't allowed to cock the weapon mm. uh, until just before uh, game time. And the funny thing is, is because we weren't soldiers. I mean, we did we did train, and when I was over in Rabat, I, I continued training with us with the SEAL guys that were there. Um, but you got to remember, like, do not flag the guy in front of you. Do not bring that weapon up. You know, you yeah. you got to move a certain way, and it's not second nature to us. We haven't had it drilled into us. I mean, we yeah. did we, we, we did for a little while, but you know, Trev, you got to do it every day for it to become, like you said, you know, when you went through those sit reps or whatever, it, it's just second nature. You're thinking about what you've got to do. The training kicks in, and we didn't have that level. Um, yeah. So f for me, I deliberately carried on doing that training uh, when, when the majority of people didn't. I mean, a couple of guys would go and say, I, I can remember vividly walking back through this like little courtyard area uh to get to the hotel and i saw harry humphreys who's um seal team two guy uh and he was the tech advisor i went harry i want to come and do some more training with you because i want to feel like i'm more on point you know i want to yeah. feel um sharp you know yeah. I, I, di I didn't want to just make oh this is a movie yeah. Um, but it was, by the way, I just want to just, I'm seeing the chat here. I just want to say something about Bobby Chacon because someone said on there, speak, I know Bobby Chacon very well. The FBI dive He's actually believe it or not. He's, uh, related to my wife, which we found out through 23 and me, which was really weird. Uh, but Bobby Chacon, who's an FBI diver and I'm actually a, um, I'm a qualified professional diver just so you know. So anyway, yeah, that's. High County is a guy I know. High County yeah. is, is a retired Navy diver. Yeah. 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 Well, I, so I, yeah, I know, I know I met him. Yeah. So, so yeah. here's the thing about Bobby Chacon. So th this is the great thing. And I'd, and I'd urge anyone out there, certainly veterans out there to, and, and I've told you about this is you need to like write your experiences because I wrote a, um, a screenplay about divers, uh, Skydance actually loved it. Um, but you know, after the abyss, people are very, very squeamish about doing, uh, diving movies because you know, they, they're worried about that, but the, there's a moment in it where they cut the umbilical and any diver on here will know this is, and I actually called Bobby Chacon up and I said, Bobby, what would you do in this situation if you were pinned down like underwater and, and your, your umbilicals stuck? And he said, you'd cut through it with a knife. Like you just go straight through the umbilical and go to your pony bottle and, and go up. So Bobby was really um, generous with me in helping me um, with my screenplay to make it authentic. So anyway, that's just, you guys should know Bobby Chacon. He's, he's got a, he's had a fascinating career and he, yeah, he writes for, uh, NCIS and CSI and um, what's the other one? Um, not cold case, Criminal Minds. It's based on my uh, my friend Jimmy um, Clemente. So anyway, well, sorry, Trev. Matthew, we've passed the hour mark. I don't want to keep people that long, but we'll chat offline. But I'm gonna gonna put this to an end, and I'm gonna start preparing. I'm gonna start preparing my questions for the next movie I want to chat to you about. Which is going to be oh Transformers. All right, yes. Okay, I've got a lot of stories about Transformers actually. <laughs> I want to hear them all. Well, mate, listen, uh, thanks for giving up your time. Uh, I'm gonna put this out on different things now. And uh I appreciate always chatting. It's always fun, it's always 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 learning. So thanks for coming on, buddy. Well, thank you, Trev. I know I've yabbered on a little bit, um, but uh, but thank you very much for having me. You're a really good friend, and I appreciate you very much.
Ditto, my friend. Ditto. Well, thank you, anyway, buddy. Take care. Have a wonderful afternoon. And I'm going to go and now I'm going to let you go and then I'm going to start promoting this. So thank you. Take care. Roger that. All right, buddy. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to come on and watch this, this chat with Matthew. It's always, I mean, always, it's always fascinating. I'd love to do it for a lot longer, but I understand how the YouTube algorithms work now. And uh, once you hit over an hour point, it starts to lose uh, promotion in different platforms. So thanks for taking the time. This is on my other channel, uh, the next uh, guest podcast, and I'm going to share on other things. So cheers, people. Have a wonderful day. It was always good to see people in the chat. Take care, guys and ladies.